Okay. This is the question about the hollow sun. Yeah. Getting energy from another dimension. I'll let you, and then, you know, you can, I think I already answered the second, second question. Uh, You know, look, I mean, I, 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 I do want to honor, you know, the general curiosity and the effort to ask the question of the person that did ask that question. But when I hear things, you know, popping up like Eric Dollar, you know, known as a modern day Nikola Tesla, says who, (laughs) you know, says who? Him? Because here's how I, you know, and and he says that the sun is is hollow and it's got an iron core, I mean, an iron plasma core with the hydrogen on the outside around that. And inside is an alien world. To me, when I hear stuff like that, it's, I think it's just... I just think it's lunacy because it's unsubstantiated scientifically. It's either a distorted interpretation, you know, to kind of gain notoriety, which is that that certainly is not far from the norm in the UFO community. You know, unfortunately, a lot of people operating in and around that community can pretty much say anything. And a segment of that community will take it as fact without checking Mm -hmm or scrutinizing what's claimed. They just take it. And frankly, that's why so many skeptics find them easy prey to attack. And even though there are some people that have a legitimate experience with UFOs and maybe even aliens, which I do not doubt, but whenever we start doing stuff like this, making ridiculous claims like that, now look, uh, you know, I actually, you know me, when something like that, I mean, I knew this was a question, so I went out and looked looked this up, really looked at the claim. And what I do immediately is like, like I cross-reference by searching for peer-reviewed you know, research or studies. I want to find out if anything in the academic community, astronomers, astrophysicists, cosmologists, real physicists, nuclear scientists, anything, I want to see if anybody has published any kind of parallel research to what this individual is saying. And it it doesn't exist. It simply, you know, doesn't exist. And there's nobody else that's claiming within the academic community that's standing up and saying that Dollard is, uh, you know, the modern day Nikola Tesla. It's not happening. It's not there. So if there's nothing to collaborate the guy's claims, and I mean, I looked at for anything from anyone, anywhere, at any time who had developed similar data or put forth a theory on the subject and it doesn't exist. So, you know, what a sent, you know, there are already people from scientific community that are looking at, you know, this claim and going, what are you even wasting your brain cells on it for? It's a, It's a, it's a simply, it's a digital photograph. It's a photograph taken on a digital camera where an artifacts like these can are are kind of commonplace, but as usual, right? The UFO community is clamoring for new news. They always are. That's how people can in that community actually get manipulated and used and abused and people take money from them, you know, because they're hoping with all hope that, You know, what this is, is real, and and, and it just isn't. There's just nothing to support it. And when they do that, you know, they get get hurt. The the whole community gets hurt when something like this comes up. I mean, the whole community loses credibility. And as a result, people who are credible are demonized. Yeah. And it can be traumatic for them just by reporting a legitimate experience. Exactly. I mean, I was a guest speaker at the UFO community multiple times back when I first started, you know, teaching, uh, got out of the army, like 96, 97, 98. And I would, I would be there. And I was even there in 2001, but one time they said, you know, I just got assigned to, to be a, to set up on a panel. And I I think I've told you there had to be like 800 to a thousand people in the audience. And there I'm sitting up at a, at a, on a table with the, like, I don't know, six other people, maybe seven. And I really didn't know what was going to be going on there. Maybe I should have paid more attention, but 
they start talking about the moon being a hot not <laughs> The moon being a hollow satellite that was towed into position or flown into position by an alien race, which, okay, Moonfall is a great movie, but it's not real. And there is absolutely no evidence of it being real. So I was sitting there and they started talking about that. And then people in the audience would come to me and go, what do you think about that? And I would go, I, I have absolutely nothing to say about that. I don't even know why I'm sitting here. <laughs> you know, I cannot, I, I have, I can't, I, you know, I cannot, I can't participate in this discussion, but I don't want to be rude and get off the stage. So I sat there and then they just kept going through the same, you know, things with these guys briefing that the moon is hollow. And then it would come back to me again. Like, what did I think about the next claim that they made about the moon? And it was the same thing for like two hours, me going, I, don't, I have nothing to say about that. I cannot contribute to this discussion. Well, well you actually remote viewed the moon. And I mean, I'm assuming you didn't find anything remotely related to that when you did. No, I'm, no. They, and they would, you know, Ingo Swan was really enamored uh, with the backside of the moon, dark side of the moon. What we were typically doing is using known things that would be on the moon. They were doing it as uh, training targets, okay? It was training targets. It was supposed to demonstrate to you that you can, you can remote view like, you know, leftover space junk on the surface of the moon. And that was what we were really being used to do. So you would come back and describe the lunar vehicle you didn't know that's what you were looking at, but you put the component pieces of it together and described, you know, the color, the texture, the temperature, the taste, the sound, the smell, the energetics, the dimensionals, you know, and, and, and intangibles, aesthetics. And you start describing all of that stuff. And then your feedback is, oh, it, okay, this is what it was. That's what we would be doing that for. I never, I never did even the dark side of the moon because I, I, I don't know, maybe my trainer not saw no purpose in it because as a tra in a training environment, if you don't have feedback, in other words, if you cannot, if you cannot validate what your data says in training, there's no reason to do it. It makes no sense whatsoever to do it. So to say or describe, if, even if I had described a city on the on a dark side of the moon or a launch pad, right? Or you know, landing spaces for alien craft, <clears throat> it would have done no, no, no good because unless we're taking pictures of and can produce feedback for the viewer to do something like that, it would be just a worthless exercise of doing something. And they wouldn't do that to you. Now, Ingo spent probably years doing that and uh, he felt he was on to something, but I, I don't know. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. It do, just didn't matter to me because I couldn't. I would, if you were going to do something like that without feedback, it goes back to what I originally said. You'd have to have like 10 viewers doing something right. like in the blind, and you'd have to be looking for correlations of data, right? Right. That's what you'd be, you know, does this viewer corroborate what this viewer says? Did this correlate with that back and forth? That gives you a sense of, degrees of accuracy, even in the absence of feedback, but it has to done, be done specifically, scientifically. It cannot be, it cannot be front-loaded. It cannot be monitored because the monitor will drive them to conclusions and that can't happen. It just has to be raw, pure viewing data. And then you look at what you've got, what you can't, what came to you. And if that happens, then we might see, you know, we might come to some understandings of those things on backside of the moon, but that didn't happen in the unit. It just didn't happen in the unit because it wouldn't have been, it would not have been fruitful. You know, and the other thing that I guess I can think of in like looking at this digital photograph of the sun where this guy draws all these great, you know, it's just a, it has no basis in science whatsoever. None. It, I just you know, drew a model and said, this is what's happening. And based on what, you know, fantasy that that's what it would be. So it, it could have been a, you know, it could have been a, a case of pareidolia, you know, 
where you start tracking with visual and in interpretations. Like this, an example of that is like for for years, people were saying that there was a face on Mars. Yes, the, yeah, the, the Sidonian face, right? That, that's pareidolia. And so what 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 we with that shadow cast on it, it looked like a face on Mars, but then a closer analysis clearly reviews it as just a, or reveals it rather as just a patternless mountain range. Or it could have been apophenia. That's another thing, identifying a pattern from meaningless data, right? So it can, and that can be, too, can be visual or auditory or like, so let me get the auditory is like electron EVP or EVR, electronic voice recognition or, or electronic voice perception, if I'm getting that correct. Or you can even see some people make established patterns in their brain on data sets. So those are real things that can happen. But in answering this gentleman's que- or, or young lady's question, it, it, it's preposterous to think that our sun is a hollow sphere housing an alien world much larger than ours. It makes no sense. And, and there's nothing to back it up other than a, the ranting of some guy, you know, claiming to be Tesla like, you know, <laughs> you know, and so I can't ever support stuff like that, but I want to give you answers to say, don't just take stuff like that at face value. You're smart people, you know, be discerning, research it, you know, look for something to substantiate it other than this, what some guy stands up and says to you. And I tell that to my students. I don't want anybody to take anything I say just at face value. I, I give you books to read and other stuff because it's important that you come to this understanding on your own, not just regurgitating what I'm saying, but we need more discernment in, in our global society. You know, we have to stop being so conspiratorial and wasting all this time and energy on things that don't matter and, and are just wasted effort, wasted human effort. There's so much more effort, be it spiritual, emotional, or physical that could be done in support of others you know, in support of the planet, in support of the global society, in support of yourself, rather than wasting time on stuff like that. It's just, it's just ludicrous that somebody comes up with something like that. But I'm not surprised from that. Unfortunately, from that community, it's something that plagues them. It does. All right. So next question, have you ever remote viewed, you know, not just the Ark of the Covenant, but Holy Mm -hmm. Grail, like historical artifacts or meaningful historical artifacts that are of note? Look, I had a, you know, my, my trainer, Gabrielle Pettengale, picked targets like the Ark of the Covenant, the Dome of the Rock, uh, you know, stuff like that. Why? Because does she have feedback on it? Yeah. I mean, you know, she has the biblical description of it and the artist renderings of what the Ark of the Covenant looked like. And her concept of the target was not for me to pinpoint where it was, but the, her, her intention of the target was for me to describe the Ark of the Covenant and describe it from a color, temperature, texture, taste, sound, smell, dimensionals, energetics, right? Intang- intangibles, et cetera. All those categories of data and to develop as much data as I could, including, you know, sketches of it and to start from with just two sets of four numbers and then to you know sketch a box with cherubs on it and then to talk about it as a as a generator and to talk about it as something that separated light and dark in a definite you know in a different perception a perceptory way for myself and to realize that uh dark whether you call it evil or what that dark was attempting to get to it because of its my perception is how I how I how I decoded that and and objectified it that that darkness was attempting to get to or was lusting after the this particular tool and then I came to an understanding of what that was which was a really freaky session I don't mind telling you right because normally. I mean, you have no idea what they're going to give you, but that was the first time something like that was done. Now, let's be honest. At the time, 
I had a very good experience Rolodex in theology. I took theology all four years in school. I was, you know, a high priest in the Mormon church at the time. I had uh, a reference and I explained, I explained in the first you know, question about this experience Rolodex. So when there's an experience Rolodex and you begin the process of detecting, decoding, and objectifying, your conscious brain, your conscious mind runs through at the speed of human thought, faster than the speed of light, according to Rao and Targ, and finds its references for that. And in that particular case, it pulled up the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I, it didn't pop up in my head as Ark of the Covenant, but I drew a box and I drew handles and I drew, you know, I understood it to be powerful and uh, I understood all those things and I drew cherubs on it and all those things. And then I find out in the feedback that it is the Ark of the Covenant, the artist concept, the Ark of the Covenant and Gabriel's concept of the target was for me to actually see the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> can I say that it, it was, you know, pure, raw, pure viewing? I can say that. But as a scientist, I have to say that there are also elements of just my experience and my experience Rolodex that allowed me to really quickly assemble that. Nothing wrong with it. I'm just trying to be honest that maybe somebody else who stepped up that had no theological training might detect, decode, and objectify that session in an entirely different way. Does that help? So, but yeah. other than that, <clears throat> no. I, you know, I didn't remote view Christ. I never, I didn't go to the crucifixion. I, you know, I didn't do any of those kinds of things. And I didn't because it would have been, I guess they figured there was only so much of that kind of stuff that they could, they could throw away with a student, yeah. right? Learning yeah. to do this. And beyond that, it served no purpose. We were an intelligence collection unit. We had real operational targets to work every day. We were spying on the real or perceived enemies of the United States. We were just one more provider of pieces of information using the methodology that we were trained in, but that's all we were doing. So the idea of going and looking at, you know, is there a God or is there not God? Is there hell? Is there not, you know, what's the nature of good and evil? All those things who killed JFK, you know, all that kind of stuff would never have been something that they would have asked us to do. Because typically, uh, if we weren't serving an intelligence need to a customer, then there was nothing for us to do in that respect. And the other thing, and I don't mean to be coy in saying this, but they also never ask us to look at things they knew the answers to. Right? Yeah, so, it would be a waste of, <laughs> waste of effort unless they needed... Unless there was some uncertainty about the answer to those questions. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, they, <clears throat> we didn't turn around and go, you know, looking for, I don't think anybody looked at Roswell. I don't think anybody ever was tasked to go, you know, find where we might have stashed alien bodies or those kinds of things. I, I just think so they would know the answer to. <laughs> exactly. They wouldn't know the answer to it and they have no feedback for it. So they, it would have been wasted. It would have been wasted training. Time. Well, if they did recover anything, they would know the answer. There would be no reason for me to take a look at it. And if they, you know, either way, they would know the answer. They would know if it was a weather balloon or not definitively. Yeah. And and you're right. And I know that it, people think, well, okay, you have, you have this trained ability to do this. Why are you not using it for these kinds of things? Meaning like, God, Jesus, you know, et cetera. And my response has always been, if my job on this planet is not to impart religion to people, <clears throat> it's not my job. My job is to empower human beings with, with this inherent ability within them by training them and training them to the absolute highest quality that I possibly can. That's my mission is to do that. And then how people decide to use it and implement it in their life, the things they might want to look at or not, <clears throat> so long as they understand the limitations and the capabilities of the phenomenon, uh, that's all I can do. 
if you want to go remote view God, it, first of all, if you front load yourself on that target, you're going to come back with your versions of God. And I will never stand up in front of a group of students and start to do something like that. I'm not going to impart, you know, something like that to them. It's not my job to try to influence them spiritually or religiously. It's my job to help them recognize how powerful they are, that they are omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and eternal. They are. And I, that's my job is to do that. And if I can accomplish that, you know, with as many people as I possibly can before I get off this mortal coil myself, you know, I'll be happy. But I, I'm not here to, to preach or to, to try to steer people that. And most of my students, they will, they will hear you. They will, they will tell you, I don't talk about God <laughs> in class. I don't talk about that. Sometimes I might use a word like creator, but I don't talk about God. And I don't talk about Christ. And I don't talk about Muhammad. Or, and I don't talk about anybody else, Buddha or anything else, because that's not my job. And I feel that it would be unfair of me to say things because in that teacher-student relationship, if I start talking about stuff like that, I would be wrongly, <clears throat> even if it was passively influencing people. And I have more integrity as a, as a teacher than, than to do something like that. So just know that. <clears throat> doesn't mean I don't carry my own versions of these things, but they're not for me to share. And, and I have not wasted time remote viewing God or Jesus <laughs> because, you know, I, it, to me, it would only be experiential and I've already had that experience in my life. So I don't need to do it now. If you enjoyed this video, hit like, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.